Hello and welcome to the Japan Archives, a podcast where we'll be delving into the histories and mythologies from Japan's long history. I'm your host, Thomas. And I'm your co-host, Heather. We'll also be reading a poem for you every week and giving a little history about the poet who wrote it. Ikimashou! Hey everyone, welcome back to the Japan Archives, episode 39. We just started recording and then Heather slurps her tea while I'm trying to record. We'll Let's try go. and edit that out. Let's go. Um, but yeah, episode 39. Last week we said we were going to do about something about Japan's first exploration of the Arctic. I got my polls wrong. I meant Antarctic, but still, there we go. We always start with the same question. Heather, do you already know anything about this or is this something that's completely new to you this week? This is completely new and I'm really excited about it. I do have a movie recommendation um, that might be tangentially related to this topic, but it's a modern movie, but I'll save that to the end. That's like literally the extent of my knowledge is from a movie I watched recently. Well, I suppose if we want to talk about this a bit like Hachiko last week, I talked a bit about the history of the owner. So I'm going to talk about you know, the guy who was behind the whole thing first. So this man was called Nobu Shirase, and he was born in Akita Prefecture. And he was born June 13th, 1861, at the Temple of Jorenji. And in fact, his father even served as the priest at the temple there. So Shirase grew up during the end of of the time when Japan was still a closed nation, so the Tokugawa shogunate. And he basically, at the age of only seven years old, he witnessed the Meiji government finally replacing that old system. And you know, Japan having been closed off for so long, the whole idea of exploration was kind of an almost entirely alien concept to the people of Japan. But Shirase, he heard of several stories of foreigners, foreign explorers, including the stories of like Sir John Franklin and his search of the Northwest Passage that he undertook. And all of this led him to being fascinated with the idea of polar exploration. However, for a little bit of time, nothing did actually come of this. He joined his father's temple for a very, very brief time, but eventually left to enter into the military. And by 1881, he'd actually received the rank of lieutenant within the transport corps. And this actually all culminated into his first expedition of a sort, not to the polar ice, but to the island of Chishima from 1893 to 1895. These islands are also known as the Kuril Islands. They're known by that in Russia as this island chain is, well, it was an island chain north of Hokkaido that was always fought over by Japan and Russia Mm. as to whether, like, who owned it, which is why the two different names. And this exploration came out came about as he mentioned his ideas of a polar expedition to his senior officer at the time, a man by the name of Kodama Gentaro, who, you know, he told him not to jump the gun at first and maybe try an island a little closer to home to make sure that he could undertake an expedition of some sort. An opportunity finally arose in 1893 when he was able to join an expedition. So this one was not his own, at least not at this point. He joined an expedition led by Naritara Gunji with the aim of establishing a permanent colony up in this island chain. Now, the expedition did go rather badly. Ill-equipped in the first winter, 10 of the men actually died and then the man who actually was leading the expedition. He left to join the war that was happening at the time. And he left Shirase in charge. The man who came along to learn how to undertake an expedition was suddenly thrown into the limelight of, you're the leader now, good luck, I have to go to war. And he was left in charge during the second winter of this expedition in which even more men unfortunately died. Eventually in 1895 they were all relieved of their duties for this expedition and Shirase 
you know, he blamed the whole failure on poor organization. But this still hadn't deterred him from his want for exploration. And all of the failures and bad things that had occurred, he, you know, he tried to write down, he tried to keep a note of them to ensure that he was better prepared for when his journey finally began, if it ever would. Hmm. Though his actual expedition did not occur for several more years after this. And that would bring us all the way up until 1910. So 15 years have passed and he still hasn't undertaken his expedition yet. And he approached the Japanese government with his plans to get Japan to the South Pole. At this time, he'd start, he'd started to hear of other countries who were also planning like similar expeditions. And he kind of wanted to beat them if he could. So he approached the government with his ideas. He declared rather optimistically that the expedition was for science and that he would have the flag of Japan raised at the South Pole in merely three years time from him approaching them, which I feel was quite a optimistic goal at the time. He was awfully hopeful for that. (laughs) He really was. When he approached the government, he stated that the powers of the world ridiculed the empire of Japan, saying that we Japanese are barbarians are strong and brave in warfare, but cowardly when it comes to the realm of science. And for the sake of Bushido, we must correct this regrettable situation. Huh, okay. I really enjoy the fact that wants to show the power and might of science. As that's I, I like that concept that, you know, usually it's it's going for warfare, but he was going for the scientific realm of expertise. I'm like, that's that I've never heard science put in that way before, I don't think. Yeah, me neither. So it was quite an interesting way to express it. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> and I suppose his statement may have worked in some form. The government did say that they would give money and they would potentially give a boat for his expedition. But in the end, they did break the promise. They didn't provide for him. And other societies actually at the time were uninterested in what he wanted to do saying that it was a mere adventure and it had nothing to do with science. And this was more based on the fact that Shirase-san was neither a scholar nor a scientist. But I kind of think that it's still a bit unfair. You know, just because you don't have the qualifications doesn't mean that you can't still want to try and do something. But Hmm. there you go. Uh, Yes, I agree with that. (laughs) As we um, keep, as we strive with our podcast, like we, you learn as you go. Sometimes it's really great. (laughs) You really do. Even the Tokyo Geographic Society in the end wrote nothing about the expedition after it had occurred, though they did write of other countries that had done so. So they really didn't feel that his expedition mounted to anything. And do you think perhaps that they weren't interested because everyone assumed it was just a lot of snow? There's nothing really much interesting there. It's just snowy. You could say that, but the fact that the Geographical Society wrote of other countries that had done polar exploration, Mm. I I think that that is potentially not their thinking. I think it was more that he's not a man of science. He just wants to have an adventure. It's not Uh. worth us giving him publicity for, Mm. perhaps. If all these societies aren't interested, and if the government isn't interested, then where did Shirase-san, you know, come up with the money for this expedition? Well, funnily enough, the government may have said no, but the previous prime minister said yes. He agreed to help. Previous prime minister's name was Okuma Shingenobu, and he established for them the Antarctic Expedition Supporters Association due to the previous prime minister's association with this association. The public began to contribute to the fund to help Shirase towards his goal. Due to this, Shirase-san also garnered the support of the Asahi Shimbun, a very important newspaper at the time, and the same newspaper that actually wrote about Hachiko from the previous episode. And still in publication, because you can get the English version online. Oh, they have English versions now. They do indeed. That's where I, uh, one of the places I get some of my news in Japan. Oh, I have to give it a go. I'll send you the link. Thank you. Now, he'd finally been getting a bit of The ball had started finally rolling for this expedition, and he received many applications to join him on this, I'll say adventure, as this is what people thought it was at the time. None of his applicants had polar experience, but I personally think that that makes sense. No one in Japan had previously done this, so it was to be expected. Mm. And only one of them 
had a scientific background, meaning, almost ironically, because there was only one scientist, he had to scale down the scientific part of his exploration. So it does look more and more right now, at least, that it is a bit of an adventure because there's only one scientist actually going. Others for the expedition that were chosen included two people from the Ainu, due to their prowess with dogs and sleds, which was going to be the transportation of choice back then in the snow. I did read that should I say initially wanted to bring ponies with him, but oh. <laughs> they wouldn't have fit on the boat, and I honestly don't think they would have survived in the Antarctic. Mm -mm. And the captain that they chose for the expedition was known as Noakichi Nomura. Now, the boat in question that they chose, you would probably think they're going to the Antarctic. They need a pretty big, sturdy boat. The boat they finally got was known as the Kainan Maru, after it was renamed from the Hokumaru. And this boat was a fishing boat. Hmm. And it was merely 100 feet long, and due to its small size, it was actually the smallest vessel at the time to ever have made an expedition to the South Pole. Ooh. Now I'm gonna say this now, the more and more I say about this, it, the more and more it seems that all the notes he potentially took on the previous failed expedition, he may have lost them or forgot them because right now it's looking more and more that they're ill-prepared. He wanted to take horses, he has one scientist. He has a small boat. <laughs> they have a tiny boat, exactly. So yeah, let's keep on going. So when they named the, when they renamed the ship the Kainan Maru, they chose its name as if they thought it was quite fitting, as it meant in Japanese, the Southern Pioneer. So quite a nice and poetic name for their journey. And like I was saying, I'll get into it now, the whole thing was kind of messy from the start, unfortunately. On the day of leaving, thousands did actually come to see them off, but the ship wasn't ready. And so the ship left the next day, 24 hours later. And because everyone had already come to wish them well, they didn't return for his actual leaving, and only ha a handful of people turned up to actually see the ship off on its maiden voyage. So they left December 1st with 27 men and 28 Siberian dogs. That's very anticlimactic. <laughs> it's like, we're going, we're going. Oh, we're not. <laughs> oh. <sighs> now it was going to be a long journey, and the plan was to reprovision at Wellington in New Zealand before heading again to the pole where they would set up and wait for the winter to end. So Shirase was then planning on the 15th of September 1911. Once the winter had finished, they could then proceed to the pole and return back to base by late February 1912. So what could go wrong, right? It's gone swimmingly so far. <laughs> Initially, the mess only continued. The boat set off in unfavorable conditions and arrived storm beaten in Wellington, where they weren't expecting a ship from Japan to turn up, and their ship turned up on February 7th. Oh, didn't they didn't wait, they were planning to reprovision. They didn't let them know that they were coming. They're just like, we're just gonna show up. Yeah, so news the people of Wellington didn't know that they would be turning up. Oh no. And to them, like, they'd set off kind of late without realizing. So this boat that was on a polar expedition had arrived unseasonably late. It looked unsuitable for polar exploration. They had no navigational charts that they could find initially. They had unsuitable food and equipment. And m unfortunately, most of the dogs had already died just on the first sailing to Wellington. So the New Zealanders regarded this whole ship and crew with a large amount of suspicion because they did not seem prepared for what Shirase was telling them they were trying to accomplish. And it's even said that the New Zealand Times newspaper offended Shirase by saying that they were gorillas sailing about in a miserable whaler. Oh, they did not say that. Oh, that's terrible. So while they were in Wellington over the next few days, as if to prove the New Zealanders right, the Japanese crew spent a lot of time desperately actually trying to find up-to-date charts for the ice conditions for their continued journey south. All they actually had at the time of sailing was a copy of a chart dating back to 1907. Eventually they left February 11th, and luckily some respect had been gained by the people of New Zealand by then. I think they were just probably in awe of their confidence of what they were trying to achieve, and a different newspaper, 
the Littleton Times wrote, Godspeed to the plucky little band of explorers from the far east. Okay, that's that's a much better description. It is. But again, he's he, he, his failed expedition in which he said was badly organized and he made notes from, right now it's looking to me that he is very much underestimated how different a polar exploration is to an island, you know, close to Russia. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out like w what exactly he he um, had sort of learned from the previous expedition because based on what you're telling me here... Um, it's not looking good, is it? Um, there are some improvements that could have been made, perhaps. I mean, through the... True. Through the lens of, you know, hundred year over 100 years later... <laughs> Oh my goodness. So sailing south, of course, there was then going to start being a, a lot of firsts for these people, a lot of things I hadn't seen before. And going south on February 17th, they, they saw their first penguin saying that it looked for all the world like a gentleman in an overcoat. <laughs> on February 26th, they saw their first iceberg. And on March the 1st, they witnessed their first ever aurora. However, it soon became apparent that they had left far, far too late for their expedition. Like, the people at Wellington thought they were suspiciously late to the season, and now it's finally dawning on them that it's too late for them. What time should they have left? Do we know? Like, I'm not actually sure, but I think at least a month or two before, um... because, well, as I'm about to say, by now there was too much ice to make a landing of any kind. Ah. And the more they tried, the worse it got. The longer they waited, the more ice there was. And in addition to this, the magnetic interference from the magnetic south pole only made things harder to navigate by compass. Oh. This all ended in March 12th when they almost became trapped by the ice. And if that had have actually happened, no doubt as the ice continued to build, it would eventually crush the ship and kill all of them. Almost defeated, they had to turn back north, and they left for Sydney to wait for the winter to end so that they could hopefully return again at a later date. Good call. By now, out of the 28 dogs, only one was left. Oh. They had died from malnutrition. I also read that a lot of them had a very bad like worm infestation, mm. which slowly affected them. And sailing back, they now reach Sydney May 1st. But all of the passengers, all 28 passengers were okay. Were okay. I mean, 27 passengers. Yes. Okay, so. Oh. All the passengers are okay for now. And but the poor yes, dogs. So they left December 1st. It's basically been six months, and they haven't even landed on the South Pole yet. They got very close, but they haven't landed yet. Now, obviously, they went to Sydney unannounced, like they did in New Zealand. So they were, again, treated with suspicion when they arrived. One newspaper even demanded that they be immediately expelled from Sydney. However, as if by luck, so maybe their luck's changing now, they gained the support from a local wealthy resident who allowed them to camp in a corner of his land whilst their boat underwent repairs. The captain of their ship returned to Japan on a different vessel to try and gain further funding for the expedition as they now saw they needed more money and resources. After all, almost all of their dogs had died. And whilst he was here, Shirase-san fortunately formed a friendship with someone known as Tanan Edgeworth David, who had already been to the Antarctic, and he had been one of three people who had discovered the location of the South Magnetic Pole. His friendship with Shirase-san basically helped the local people stop regarding him and his crew with suspicion, and they finally started to accept their presence here in Sydney. And Edgeworth even helped Shirase by giving him a lot of his experience and knowledge from his time in Antarctica. One hopes that he wrote it down and researched it <laughs> thoroughly. I do hope so. Eventually, the captain of the ship does return to Sydney. He has been given more funding. He's been given more dogs. He's brought more dogs back with him. And he's even brought two new crew members for the expedition. Another scientist, and this time a film cameraman. Ooh. By this point, Shirase abandons plans of conquering the South Pole. They, it's, it's been months now, and he believes that others who've already set out to reach the South Pole would be too far ahead of him. So again, in a twist of fate, he's changing his expedition once again to try and make it actually one of science. Which wasn't that what he was trying to do anyway, the Bushido of science? 
he wanted it to be science, but then he only had one scientist, so he just was going to go to the South Pole. But now he has more scientists. He's changing it again to let's not get to the South Pole. Let's instead go for science. Yay, science. And he decides that he would head to Antarctica with the aim of surveying and exploring the area known as King Edward VII's land. So they arrived in May, and they finally leave again from Sydney, November 19th, 1911. So it's been 11 months now since they left Tokyo. Still haven't reached the pole. But before they did so, Shirase-san was gifted Edgeworth with his 17th century samurai sword. A thank you for everything he had done for them during his time in Sydney. And I found out you can actually find the sword still in the Australian Museum. It was donated there in 1979 by... Edgeworth's daughter, Mary David. And like I said, it is looking up for them now. They finally received the proper goodbye that they had wanted initially from Japan. And many people came to see the ship set sail. And they even like it said they threw their white handkerchiefs and their black hats into the air as they sailed away. So finally, they have the proper send off that they wanted. Excellent. They left in fair weather. There was no storm this time. And by January 4th, 1912, they had reached the area which had sent them to Sydney the first time. Now the sea was finally open and they could make good progress. And by January 10th, they had their first sight of an area known as the Ross Ice Shelf. Shirase commenting on it, saying it looked like a gigantic white snake at rest. As they grew closer to this, they started to sail east in an attempt to find a landing spot near King Edward VII's land. Again, in some weird ironic tryst, ironic twist, they were attacked by killer whales after sailing through an area known as the Bay of Whales. But the killer whales did soon withdraw, and it said that the Ainu people at the time, as they were quite religious, they prayed throughout the the entire ordeal as they feared for their lives. Finally, they did come to an area suitable for the landing of the Kainan Maru. However, the terrain would have been impossible to hmm. traverse. So the, the boat could dock, but they couldn't have gone anywhere. They quickly named it the Kainan Bay in honor of the ship that brought them there and sailed onwards. So they've docked, but they were unable to get off the boat. So they still haven't got to the pole yet, technically. And this is where it gets a little bit confusing. So bear with me. So you have the crew. Shira say now he's, he keeps changing his ideas. He's now breaking the crew into two different groups oh okay one is going to be a what he calls a dash patrol so they're going to land on the antarctic and march south across the ice with their dogs as far as they can and the other second party is going to land on king edward the seventh land with the aim of exploring the area for science so i guess again he's changed his mind and now it's not just adventure it's not just science it's they sailed east past the bay of wales past what they called the kainan bay and found nowhere to land so they sail back west heading towards the ross ice shelf shirase and his bear with me i'm getting confused myself. i know I'm, I'm sitting here i'm like looking off to the side i'm picturing okay there's a party here there's a party here but the party here couldn't go here so then they got on the ship to go so sailing back west when they find an area in which they can safely dock and leave the boat shirase takes his small crew and shirase wants to be part of the adventure group so he's in the dash patrol and they set up camp and see the kainan maru sail onwards shirase took six other people with him for his dash patrol as well as all the dogs two of these men stayed at base camp to undertake meteorological observations So a little bit of science going on. And the others and the other people he took with him. So it was the two Ainu people and two other people called Takeda and Misho. Their sole aim, like I've said, was to travel as far south as they could in their limited time frame. So they wouldn't, they couldn't reach the South Pole anymore. But let's see how far Japan can get south. In their first day, they only traveled 13 kilometers. The next day, they unfortunately had to remain in their tents the entire time due to bad weather. And over the course of the next few days, they had to travel through a lot of really, really bad storms, which again caused a lot of the dogs to unfortunately die. By January 28th, they finally stopped, having covered a distance of 250 kilometers. They decided they'll go no further south. Here they placed 
a canister in the ground with the names of their small group, dubbed the area where they were as the Yamato Yukihara, so the Japanese snow plain. It said that they saluted the emperor, had a small celebratory ceremony, and then began their return to base. Due to favorable conditions, they made the entire journey back in only three days. Oh, wow. Which at the time was likely to have been the quickest polar sled journey to have happened. Exhausted from their entire journey, they then slept nonstop for 36 hours. That is really impressive. I could see, I could understand the sleeping the 36 hours. That I think they needed, needed it at that point. Oh, my goodness. So essentially, everyone's okay at this point. No one... All the people are fine. It's just, unfortunately, they're having... Really, really bad luck for the dogs. Yeah, the poor dogs. I feel bad for the, all the dogs so far. Oh, and what were the names of the two Ainu travelers? Explorer, scientist, <laughs> expeditioners? <laughs> I don't know. Wait. Everything I read merely only said two Ainu people. Oh, okay. I couldn't find their names. Okay, I'll see if I can if I can get the professor to help to search in Japanese. That would be good. So while they're sleeping for 36 hours, let's go on to the King Edward VII exploration. The Kainan Maru arrived at the at a place called the Bisco Bay in January on January 23rd. Strangely, I've heard of that before. <laughs> Bisco Bay. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. Now they arrived thinking that they were going to be the first to explore this area. Sadly, they weren't. However, they were the first group to make a landing in this area from sea. All of the people who had explored this area until them had had to come via land. Here, this group, so Shira says already split them into two groups, but this group then splits themselves into two as well. One attempted to head south, do a bit of exploration, but unfortunately they were stopped by ice. And the other small group, they managed to reach the foothills of a mountain range known as the Alexandra Mountains before they too were also forced to stop. They couldn't make it any further. And here they erected a sign, explored the area a little bit as much as they could. They collected a few rock samples before finally returning to their ship. Hmm. So I guess this group, which was there for science, they did a little bit. They could only do a little bit of exploration before they couldn't get any further. But at least, you know, some science was achieved like Shira said did originally want. The King Edward VII group returned to their ship, their exploration finished. The boat then travels back west because it needs to go pick up Shira mm. say again. On their way around, they find a new bay, which they decide to call the Okuma Bay in honor of the ex-prime minister who has helped them. And finally, make it back to the area in which Shirase and the other men were camping. However, their boat was halted for two days by the ice, so they couldn't pick them up for another two days. And unfortunately, in the hurried process of saving Shirase and the others, every single dog was abandoned, much to the heartbreak of everyone on the crew. Oh. And it said that Shirase remembered them every day from then on in his daily prayers. Oh, why? Why did they abandon them? I'm not sure. Apparently it just says they were so hurried and frantic of trying to get them back on board with, I guess, how the ice was at the time that they made a priority for the people and then they thought it was too risky to stay and get the dogs. Oh, Okay, now my heart's broken too. It's really sad after, yeah, last week was a sad dog story and now all these poor dogs as well. So next week we need to find a happy dog story. <laughs> we do. After all of this, they finally returned to Wellington, exhausted. So that was it for their exploration. They did a little bit of science. Mm. They went as far south as they humanly could. They lost all their dogs, but... No one else had actually died. None of the crew members. That is impressive. Like they had no injuries. They died of no sickness from anything. Wow. So in Wellington, Shirase and a few others from the group, they get onto a faster ship to return back to Japan so that they could prepare for the return of the expedition. And after all of these hardships, the Kainan Maru finally arrived back in Tokyo on June 19th, after sailing 31,000 miles, the Kainan Maru returned to a large reception and celebration. So after all of this, they may not have gotten to the South Pole as they initially intended, but it did show to people that the Japanese could actually mount a successful Antarctic expedition. Hmm, for science. However, it's for science, of course. But 
its legacy was quickly forgotten. Shirasei and the others were praised by the emperor at the time, but the emperor did sadly die six weeks after his return. Oh. And so the expedition lost interest in the public's eye. The government also didn't help Shirasei with any of the debts compiled from the expedition, and there was little interest from people to buy Shirasei's book about his journeys as well. Even though some money was made through a documentary film, Shirasei unfortunately gained none of the profits, as he had also sold off the rights entirely to the film company. Around the world as well, the expedition was little noticed, eclipsed by other explorers at the time, and the fact that his exploration was only published in Japanese, which was still little known in the world back then, it only hindered Shirasei's story being spread and learnt about in other countries. And it wasn't until 1933 that the first substantial account of his exploration was made in English in the Geographical Journal. Due to all of these unfortunate circumstances, Shirasei was left to settle his debts for himself, and he returned to Kuril Island, so the island where he did his first expedition, and made a bit of money through a fox fur business until he eventually did pay off all his debts by 1935. And two years prior to this, 1933, he did receive a belated recognition for his exploits, and he was made an honorary president of the Japan Polar Research Institute. And unfortunately, he did die in obscurity in 1946. His name does live on, though. The current Japanese Antarctic Research Expedition has named their research vessel the Shirasei, and in his hometown of Nikaho, a statue in his memory as well as a museum about his expedition has actually been created. And that is the story of Shirasei-san and his exploration of Antarctica. But one last thing, the boat that took them all the way, the Kainan Maru, it was sold back to its owners, going back to its humble fishing vessel self. And unfortunately, we don't know what happened to it in mm. the end. We have records saying that in 1944, there was a fishing vessel by the same name that was sunk in a USAAF attack in the Gulf of Tonkin. But whether this was the same ship or not, we will never know. So how the story ends for this vessel, I unfortunately cannot say. But there you go. That is his story. That is the story of Japan's first attempt to get to Antarctica. There was a, there's a lot. That was five pages of notes. That was a lot of research. And it, it got very confusing, even for me, when his party split into two and I it's, I had to figure out what the hell was going on. It split into two, then it split again, too, into two, further two. But I th I found it very interesting. I, I don't know much about polar exploration, even for other countries. And I can't remember how I stumbled across this. Yeah, I was gonna... Because most of my books are like old Japanese history, but I stumbled across this and I read it and I thought I thought it was interesting. I hope you liked it. I hope the people at home did as well. Something I think this is the very different to our usual things, but there you go. But what did you think? You know, it's really interesting that no one was really interested it's interesting that no one was interested. <laughs> I get what you mean though. Why didn't anyone want to buy the book? This is, I mean, you just telling me the story is incredibly fascinating because it's... From what I read, it was, he wrote it as like a one-man hero book. Ah, oh, okay. Well... Like, everything was like his perspective and it was like he was the superhero from the book. And at the time, such a type of book was falling out of favor. Mm. So unfortunately, he wrote it in the wrong genre. Mm. Maybe if he had wrote it as more of an account of like how everyone was involved in things, it might have sold better. But unfortunately, the, yeah, the way he wrote it mm. kind of shot him in the foot a little. Because mm. the story itself is, is really fascinating, especially where, where he started out like, I've learned from the mistakes of the previous journey and it looks like he really didn't. But through pure, I guess, pure chance, he met someone who helped him to set up a successful expedition. And even having that success, success, successful expedition still had some issues, which, you know, is typical of, of most expeditions you're going to have. Something's going to go wrong. But to not lose any of your crew members to have actually made it across the fastest, what well, fastest journey across the the um where was it yeah the, the quickest polar sled journey at the time he actually he he met a had a goal and they they were able to get some 
materials for science. I'm not, I don't think I heard you say anything about if they were able to publish any findings. I'm assuming they probably weren't able to publish anything new, probably just verify some things people had already had already discovered themselves. So I'm guessing maybe not the most successful scientific expedition, but it was, it had a lot of successes, except for the poor dogs. But I mean, no, no people died. So, I mean, that was, I mean, I, I've, I've, oh gosh, it's been so long since I've studied. I think it was like, was it back in like, I'm not sure if it was college or high school. We studied about like um, some of the polar expeditions, but I mean, it's been years since I've thought about this. <laughs> I mean, Japan still does research there now. I don't know whether Shirasei in, like I said, their research special is called the Shirasei, but I don't know if Shirasei is the reason that they endeavored to go back or if they there was a different mindset or a different group of people who encouraged them to go mm. and yeah they they commenced their scientific activities again in the antarctic in 1956 ah so it was after and they have actually found a lot of things that have helped science a lot in recent years they've found things such as antarctic meteorites a hole in the ozone Mm. recovery of climate change through the analysis of ice cores. We now understand the generation of the aurora better because of research undertaken by the Japanese. And they even found a strange ecosystem which lives in one of the lakes in Antarctica. And they also, due to their research in Antar in this area, they found evidence of the continent known as Gondwana. So they have found things since, mm. but whether it was Shirasei who inspired them to go back, I'm not entirely sure. I mentioned at the beginning, which I don't know if you're going to keep it or you're going to cut it, but um, the one thing I do know about Japanese polar exploration, I have I have a movie recommendation. So this week, I don't have a book recommendation, but I I do have a movie recommendation that ties in really nicely with this story. Um, the English title is Chef of South Pole, and it is about okay. it is about a chef from the um, Japanese, I guess, self defense forces. It's a man who has to go for a year to help um, prepare the meals for the scientists in the South Pole who are doing research on climate on ice cores um on different things on that that polar base camp so it's quite it's a one of my favorite movies honestly it's become one of my favorites the music's really good the acting's phenomenal but it's a very kind of gentle story about this man who gets put in the situation that he didn't want and didn't expect uh, over a year away from his family to cook for all of these scientists in the south pole i Definitely recommend it. You actually will see some of the like how they access the um, the ice cores. It's quite fascinating, um, and you'll actually get to see kind of like how life would be as a scientist. And I think this is done back in the was it around two thousands, perhaps. So before like you know a lot of video chatting and email and communication. So pre um, pre cell phone days, um, how they were able to communicate with their families. But I I recommend that because it's. I mean, the movie itself, it's its really good. It's a study kind of in being put in a situation that you don't expect to deal with the different, the eternal night where you have like, you know, it's at a certain point in time, you have no daylight hours, having to be with the same people in a small space for over a year at a time. And even the challenges of cooking, like you can't always get access to things quickly. So, and just the interaction of all the characters. So it, it actually ties into your story quite a bit hmm, it does i thank you for the recommendation i'll have to give it a go but i'm glad you liked it and now i am very intrigued for today's literature corner now you already told me who it's by yes i did but obviously i don't know what the poem will be today i do know that you told me it is themed for today so i'm very excited for that so yeah take it away excellent thank you thomas so yes i i started this week out wanting the, the theme so i looked for the theme but you know what thomas we, we hadn't mentioned we've mentioned about this man but we haven't talked about him for several months now yosa buson so for my poem this week we're going to revisit um, Busan. Back last year, we didn't talk so much about him. 
We didn't know much about him back then, did we? We were still figuring out this show and what we were doing. So, yes. Still still working on the figuring it out, which is really fun. Oh, I wanted to, because Busan is one of the, one definitely one of the major Japanese poets. I wanted to talk a little bit about him because I want to come back to Busan and talk about different aspects because Busan wasn't just a poet. He was also a painter. He multifaceted, multi-talented man. We're going to talk just a little bit about him today, and we're going to revisit him hopefully very soon. So Busan was born in 1716 in Osaka, and his family name was Taniguchi. He moved from his home to Edo, or Tokyo, at the age of 20 to learn poetry from Hayano Haijin. Now, Busan was a follower of Basho and would eventually follow the same path as Basho, as described in the Okono Hosumichi. And he also published his own work from this journey, and he published it under the name Busan. And it was the first time he used Busan for his works. Ah, I see. Now, he also traveled further throughout Japan, but at the age of 42, he eventually settled in Kyoto and also started to use the name Yosa, which came from his mother's side. He married soon after that and had one daughter. Now, Busan has lots of different topics about poetry, but one of the ones that the professor mentioned to me is a lot about family. Now, I have two published works, and I had to get the professor to help me with this. Um, the names of two of Busan's work is the Kushu, which translate to, translates to poem book, and a Chinese book, and I'm, this is a little difficult, but I'll try, the Shuhu Batakyoku. So those are two published works, and that's actually in kanji, so I had to get help with those. So there's a little bit about Busan. I want to come back because I want to talk about his painting at a later point, but today is a taste of Busan. When I started doing the research, I have quite a few links here, but I pulled some things from a little bit on, on different places. But yeah, I was kind of surprised to be a popular and prolific um, poet. It, it he doesn't have, it is not so, so much information. I think there's quite a bit in Japanese. So I'm going to get the professor to help me more <laughs> with that. So a little bit about Busan. And if you're ready, I will. And you got your pencil and paper. <laughs> I'm ready for the poem. All right. Yaro kase to katana nagedasu fubuki kana. Okay. I mean, I heard two things that I know are Japanese words, but unfortunately I don't know the English. So I heard yado. Mm. And it, I feel that it is a word I do know. And as soon as you say the English, I will remember. I heard katana, but it might be a different katana than what I'm thinking. No, you're right on that. Oh, okay. And I heard hubuki. Hubuki, hi. But my brain keeps thinking kabuki. <laughs> so I'm not quite sure about that word. So yeah, I heard a few things, but this week, I'm not entirely sure about what it, this could mean. Okay. Well, I will give you the translation. The professor helped me a little bit with this. So I, I've got it from a source, but I also, he gave me something kind of casual, so. It's kind of more a personal translation. In a way, yes. Give me shelter. He threw the katana in the snowstorm. So why is he throwing a katana in a snowstorm? Oh, well, glad you asked because I liked this poem. I thought it was really interesting, but I... You know, I was the same with you. I was like, hmm, that's interesting. Why is he throwing it? I don't know. Well, luckily the professor came to my rescue. And the professor said, this poem is describing a samurai who's demanding to be put up for the night in a snowstorm. So essentially him throwing away the sword is kind of indicates that he's, it's, um, he's just like tired and he's done because throwing your sword as a samurai is not not a good manner. So kind of maybe a little bit perhaps rude and arrogant demanding to be put up for the night. That's interesting. I would have never got that. Mm. But it makes sense once you hear it explained from the perspective of someone who is Japanese. Mm. So yeah, as usual, I like it now that I understand it better. It is, that's the interesting thing. Oh, I say interesting. I say interesting a lot. <laughs> I would have interpreted it as maybe because obviously I'm not Japanese, as he throws a sword away because the person won't give him lodging because they fear him having a weapon. So he throws it away to say, please give me lodging. Oh, 
Okay, yeah. I won't hurt you, which is an entirely different interpretation. Oh, I like that. Yeah, because I, well, when I first encountered it, it was just, it was, mm, I mean, I mean, I think my interpretation was he seemed kind of demanding. <laughs> I think uh, so when I my first encounter I was like oh he seems awfully demanding but the the katana was like why would he throw his sword that's so strange but when it, when when the professor explained it to me it, it made more sense but I mean that's the that's the thing is with the poems is that some of the why it's really important also to study I think history in conjunction with the poetry because to know the historical like we didn't know that historical reference that's in there that would have been common knowledge at the time but we're still learning a lot of this stuff so i mean this it's nice some of the poems that we've encountered like the the sleeve the sleeve thing like how important sleeves were because it was also a place to you know store items um so it was like kind of like your almost like a backpack or a purse so the sleeves have an importance that you know we would have thought oh it's a sleeve like no a sleeve is not just a sleeve it's also where your possessions go as the i i really enjoy encountering that's why i i often search for things that i go i'm not sure about that because i like i want to learn more and understand more but really i really wanted a winter poem and i wanted something interesting and not something I was assuming something bad was going to happen with an Arctic expedition. So I was like, let's balance it out, which, you know, it did, but not as catastrophic as I feared. <laughs> so I wanted to go the more kind of lighthearted winter route as opposed to, you know, quite several of the poems where mourning someone or dying or it wasn't the quite right time for that. <laughs> but no, thank you for the poem. I definitely, I liked it and I like the something you found that shows that interpretation can vary wildly which i like i also have a bonus poem that's not oh, do it. not winter based and this is only in english because i pulled this I, when i was doing my research i pulled some information from a website and then i saw something about overripe sushi so i i had to i had to include this one even though i don't have the japanese for it i'm going to search for it is this also a busan or is it an interesting one you just came across i believe it it is indeed a busan okay yes it is a busan poem which i saw over right sushi i went that's not what i expected at all so this english translation and i've included the link in the show notes overripe sushi the master is full of regret it sounds like he got food poisoning for me. It kind of does. But as, my, as your bonus Busan for today, only in English, thank you to the person who contributed it for educational purposes. Thank you so very much. I learned a lot. I really enjoyed this I poem. Did, I like that one. It's, it's one where the person is suffering, but it also is kind of humorous. Full of regret. I will yeah. find the Japanese for this poem. I must find it. This is great. Sounds good to me. So that's my segment for today. <laughs> okay. I would do a book recommendation for today, but you've done a movie recommendation about Japan. And the stuff I used was mostly like journal entries. So I don't have a book for today. I will definitely do a book recommendation for next week. Still, I feel like a broken record. My cherry book hasn't arrived. <laughs> and I was thinking of what we could do. And I was thinking of doing a surprise. However, looking at my shelf from where I'm sat. Oh, I want to do, oh, I don't know. What do you think, Heather? I would like to do an episode on the folklore of cats in Japan. Yes. Oh my gosh. Please, 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 please. Yes. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. Okay. We're doing it. We're doing so it. So I'll do some, I have a few books that talk about that and I could definitely give some book recommendations after the episode next week. So yes. Okay. Next week, guys, episode, wow. Episode 40, that will be, will be the folklore of cats in Japan. We didn't do the bonus this week. Ugh. Basically it's, it's been a week. Let's just say that. So next week, we were going to do another bonus. So we, you will have two bonuses next week. They'll come out the same day on Wednesday. We have one about proverbs. And I also want to do a little bit about a man who collects tattoos. So we'll talk about that next week as well. I'm intrigued. And as ever, your poem or song will be a surprise. Although I do feel that you will try and find a cat-related poem for we're, next week. We're going to have or a, a cat. song. Yeah, cat. There's, there's going to be something cat-related. So it's not a surprise. There will be a cat. <laughs> Hey, mini cats. But until then, guys, thank you for still tuning in, despite everything that's going on around the world. Thank you so much. And until next week, guys, have a good week. 
stay safe. But yeah, that's everything for me. Matane. It's everything for me too. Thank you guys. Matane. If you've enjoyed the Japan archives, please consider checking out historyofjapan.co.uk, a database we are making on Japanese history. You can also find the show notes for all our episodes here. If you're on Instagram, you can follow my account over at nexus underscore travels. That's N-E-X-U-S underscore travels. We also have a Facebook and Twitter page, which you can find at Japan Archives. If you're interested in little slices of life in Japan, be sure to check out my website over at heatheroveryonder.com. Thank you for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you have any suggestions for future episodes, have anything you'd love to hear about, head on over to historyofjapan.co.uk and send us a message. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give us a rating and review over on iTunes. Thank you again for listening, guys. Until next time. Bye. Matane.